From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Here's what's ahead. On the latest installment of FSA Coffee Talk, David Shem of the Farm Service Agency will outline the second round of the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. He'll talk about the three types of relief payments that will be made to producers under the program. Following then, K-State's Ignacio C.M. Pitti will discuss a problem that's turning up in some cornfields around Kansas, just ahead of harvest, a weakening of the ear stems that leads to ear drooping. He'll explain what causes this condition. And later on our weekly wildlife management segment, K-State's Charlie Lee will review a new study of tracking wildlife with camera traps. All that and more right here on Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. While the CDC urges you to avoid close contact, like hugging or shaking hands, there are other non-physical ways to say hello. Wave, wink, use sign language, salute, smile, give the peace sign, throw up an air high five, do jazz hands. Remember, stay a minimum of six feet or two arms length away from others and stay home if you can. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, our Tuesday edition. Thanks for joining us once more. We're around again to another Farm Service Agency update for you via what we call this series, the FSA Coffee Talk. The end of this past week, the USDA announcing the particulars on the next round of coronavirus food assistance. That program, CFAP2, is actually open for business as of yesterday. Along with us now, the State Director of the Farm Service Agency here in Kansas, David Shim. David taking time away from wheat planting in northwest Kansas to visit with us here. And we might note, David, right out that your staff all across Kansas, the FSA, are already prepped on this program and are handling producer applications for it, correct? You know, we have started taking some. This is uh, the rollout of this program, Eric, has been a, a very fast rollout. From our standpoint, our offices have received uh, uh, training, but still, again, have questions. Uh, we're engaging from a state office as well as from a national office level, engaging with them, getting answers uh, clarified so that our offices know how to handle some of the applications that come in. But yes, like you noted here, the CFAP2 Coronavirus Food Assistance Program did open up here on uh, the 21st. Kind of a relatively short time frame for a sign up uh, through December 11th. No, it's a busy time uh, for producers, but we've got you a little bit of time here for you to be able to get signed up too. And keeping in mind that the protocols for doing business with FSA remain as they have been the last several months. So folks need to keep that in mind. Yeah, absolutely. You know, obviously, as the uh, COVID-19 continues to have impact across the state, obviously be reaching out there to our local county offices. Our local county offices have been trying to be very proactive and working with their producers, finding ways to get those signatures, you know, even with uh, a lot of electronic signatures that we're able to work out now, so for some of those uh, producers that have that EOS level access, they can actually get in there online at farmers.gov and be able to start the process that way. So again, reach out to that local office, get a hold of them, kind of see what their status is, if you can get an appointment, or they'll definitely help walk you through. With that reminder then, David, tell us about CFAP2 and Generally speaking, how it differs from the first round of the coronavirus food assistance program as it would pertain to Kansas agricultural producers. Sure, absolutely. So, you know, when the original kind of remind everybody when the original CFAP came out, you know, it was designed to handle the losses sustained by our producers across the state on the livestock side, as well as the crop side, specialty crop side uh, as well through kind of that first quarter of, of this year. And, and then it kind of stopped there. You know, I think for all of us, we kind of didn't know what the full impact of obviously the COVID-19 would have on markets and, and various dynamics like that. So with the CFAP2 coming out, it was more focused upon now this time frame since then 
up until now. And kind of that basis is very similar to what the first CFAP was. It's for those crops that have had a 5% or greater loss on them. And so that's what was kind of evaluated. So CFAP 2 has what we would call three categories, Eric. It's got a sales commodity uh, category. And I, I just kind of overall, I would say what the sales category is primarily targeted much more to our specialty crop producers that we have out there. Uh, you know, that would also include, you know, some of your like, you know, aquaculture or possibly wool, a few things like that. So that's more and it, just from an overview, Eric, there's a couple of factors going in there, but basically it, it takes into account what the producer's 2019 sales were, and it's about roughly 10% is what the assist would be within that. Again, it's a varying range to a little bit above or a little bit below, depending upon what their sales are. So that's the first category, and that's the sales commodity. Second one was the price trigger. It is definitely much more targeted towards you know the row crops, livestock, and dairies. But again, those are ones that had that 5% loss through that basically January through July. And so within that second one, that price trigger, basically what it is is they come in there and figured out how much percentage of that crop would be marketed at that time frame for the crops going. And then based upon that percentage of marketing rate, a payment rate was established for that. We are utilizing uh, RMA data, which are, you know, APH yield is for those producers. So basically it's that yield, that APH yield multiplied times the crop marking percentage multiplied by the uh, payment rate is kind of what it gives. And that's the rate. Now, that kind of will then flow over into the third category, though, Eric, and that's the flat rate for the row crops uh, specifically. And that flat rate is just simply a $15 per acre minimum. So it's the higher. So i uh, give example here. So for like right now, corn, they're suggesting that 40% of the crop for this year's crop would be marketed. And, you know, with the payment rate of 58 cents, if a producer has an APH of 100 bushels or 120 bushels here in the state, depending upon where they're located in the state, they would multiply that by that 40% and multiply that by that uh, 58 cents of payment rate. So that kind of is a baseline. If that payment rate is less than, you know, in that $100, it would probably be more than, but if it's actually less than, then they go with the $15. If it's higher than the $15, then the producer gets paid upon the higher of, of one or the other. So definitely a little bit different structure on that. On the beef cattle side, on the more of the livestock things, it's basically kind of a uh, flat rate for them. For the beef, it's $55 per head, you know, a maximum of roughly 4,500 head that a producer could get uh, paid on. So just a real, you know, rough overview, Eric, there of kind of what the program is looking like to try to, again, uh, help producers handle the impact that they have all seen upon their uh, crops they grow and their livestock they produce. David, a notable addition to this CFAP is wheat, and all wheat classes have been included. Of course, that's quite germane to Kansas, so you might talk about that. Yeah, ab- absolutely, and and that's one of the things that, again, the last the last CFAP program, they did go through a what they would call a NOFA process, Eric, and NOFA funding availability, gave an opportunity for various commodities to try to show a 5% loss. But, you know, unfortunately, wheat didn't get included on that first round of CFAP. But you're exactly right. On the second CFAP round here, uh, wheat was included. Again, that's all classes. And it is one where, you know, they're basing, again, for Kansas, that's significant because most of our wheat is harvested in the um, June, July time frame there. And so when it's harvested in that time frame there, they figured that by now, what they're calculating is right at 73 percent of your wheat crop has been harvested. Again, the payment rate then on wheat is 54 cents an acre. So, again, like my earlier example with the corn on the wheat side, it's what a producer's uh, RMA, uh, APH is. Then uh, what will happen is they'll multiply that times that 73% crop marketing percentage that we figured for wheat and then multiply by the 54 cents there. And one of the things I will note, and there might be a few producers out there in this situation, but if there is not RMA data available, we do then rely upon a ARC County uh, yield to factor in instead of the RMA data. So for some of those producers that maybe don't utilize uh, the crop insurance, there is still an option for them to be able to approach and, and help that 
There has been also uh, payment limitations set specifically for this program as well. Uh, that payment limit is 250000 for this. There is some, uh, you know, qualifications when you get into either a corporation or a limited liability, limited partnership, uh, various things like that, that can affect that. But in general, for each person, it is right at $250,000, which would be the payment limitation. All right. Of course, local FSA personnel can walk a person through all of this handily, and uh, that's why that contact with those folks is so important here. As far as uh, prepping for this application process, what should producers in general do, David? Uh, I think the biggest thing that a producer would have, uh, Eric, and maybe I say this just a little bit tongue-in-cheek, is have patience with our offices out there. You know, we do have the RMA data. We should be able to pull that RMA data over. And then once we can kind of get that data pulled in, we'll be having producers uh, either reaching out or producers, again, reach out to us. We'll have you, uh, you know, sign up on the form. Uh, and then be able to proceed forward there. But, yeah, our offices have been just absolutely terribly busy this year. You know, we just got done here recently with acreage reporting. And right before that, it was uh, ARC and PLC sign up there. And here shortly, we're, we're hopefully to uh, be able to start to issue some payments for CRP. We've had CRP sign up going on as well, but issue some payments for CRP as well as uh, ARC PLC contracts out there. So, Offices are just really busy, Eric. So the biggest thing I guess I would ask for producers is uh, definitely uh, reach out to that office, but be patient with them. They have been real busy. They want to serve you. I know they want to serve you and and help out our producers, but uh, be patient. And they will turn those payments around as fast as possible. That's the point here. Absolutely, Eric. Once more, the second round of Commodity Food Assistance Program payments for producers will be commencing once one enrolls in those options, becomes qualified for them. FSA offices statewide are now accepting those applications. We'll do so through December the 11th. So as David has said, do establish that conversation with your local FSA folk, and they can help you through the process. David, we'll let you get back to the drill and get more of that wheat in the ground and appreciate your time. Thank you, Eric. On the latest FSA Coffee Talk, that's David Shim, the state director of the Farm Service Agency here in Kansas. And you're listening to Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Agriculture Today returns now on the K-State Radio Network. A little troubleshooting for you corn growers now, as joining us via phone is Ignacio Ciampitti, Crop Production and Cropping Systems Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. We want to talk about two things today, and one of those, Ignacio, something you're hearing more about and actually seeing in the field as corn harvest begins to pick up, and that is what you're terming droopy ears in corn you say is happening with some frequency out there around Kansas currently? Yeah, thanks Eric for the invitation. Mm-hmm. And I think that is very peculiar this year. I mean, we know about all the all the challenges that we are having currently, but also ryland corn in many places uh, where they receive timely rain looks very good. And then we started receiving reports from uh, multiple farmers, and this was something that happens very suddenly from one week to the next. We have farmers telling us, going to the field, looking at the corn, and the ears were upright, which is the usually position that we expect to see the ears until they reach a black layer, which is maturity. And usually they reach that point when the kernels are around 35% gray moisture. This is the normal, uh, but we are in a year that probably we are far from normal. <laughs> so many of these uh, farmers start reporting that a week after they start seeing years in some places were well, not even close to black layer or maturity that those years start basically i mean uh there were these we term the concept of uh, droopy years on the sense of i mean we are seeing those years hanging and we understand why the plant is doing that in the sense of 
usually that happens when the plant is uh, lacking enough sugars to maintain those kernels, and then the plant starts using any sugar carbon that is available inside of the plant until the moment that this, the plant is getting into the shank. Once the shank basically is starved, um, we call it cannibalized, and then losing the turgidity is the moment that basically that shank is giving up and we see those ears completely hung from the plant. And the plant really has no choice. It's needing all the sugar and carbon it can possibly find. And in in that shank, that's the last reservoir of sugars for it to tap into then. Yeah, it's the it's, it's closest proximity. The, the plant probably will not touch this one until it finishes basically extracting and removing everything that is from the stems. Mm-hmm. Usually what happens is we have, towards the end of the season, heat or drought stress affecting that plant. So what the plant does is basically immediately shutting down, I mean, basically starting this process of uh, senescence. And in most of the situations, I mean, that plant will remove whatever is available, nutrients, water, and trying to fill those kernels and finish. Mm -hmm. This year, we are seeing something that is a little bit unique on the sense of, I mean, we are seeing plants that they look extremely green, and then those ears are hanging. And the main question from many farmers was, you open up, I mean, you look at the, the ears when you open the husk, and you start seeing that those ears were, at the beginning, in some cases, were in midpoint of the grain filling. The plant was rushing to maturity when the the ears and the sugars are not really moved from the plant to the to the ear because once the shank is cannibalized and it's not functional because it's it's not connected to the plant once it's hanging, those kernels basically they rush into maturity. So the outcome of that is that you need to start thinking that a potential impact of that is you went from potentially a green feeling that would be excellent or very good to something that is could finish that if the stress came too early, uh, you can finish with something that is a very poor feeling, uh, extremely poor, and you will finish with very, very light kernels. I mean, those kernels, they are 50%. If they were early in the green feeling, 50% only on the total final weight. We could easily lose just for this phenomenon 20 bushels in a rush, mm. a very good yield for corn. Wow. So it can make and a significant are, still, difference. Yeah. yeah. Still we are exploring, as I mentioned, because some of the things that we are, we are exploring are related to in some of the months during the year, we have less than optimal temperature. Uh, we have, I mean, some places in July and August, very cool. I mean, for thinking about the optimal photosynthesis in corn and carbon fixation, we were probably not on the optimal side. We have many cloudy days. And that also affects the ability of that plant to produce more reservoir of sugars. Then we have, if you are in dryland environment, we have high evapotranspiration in some places. So, and towards the end of the season, we talk about this on soybeans in the last couple of weeks, we have in some places a dry spell. And then I think that there was a completely, I mean, very delicate balance between the size of those plants and the years. The main problem is that if we didn't have enough reservoir of carbon, even if those plants were able to maintain and to fix carbon, I think that we are seeing in this situation just a consequence of uh, the combination of multiple factors that first we are shooting for extremely high yields in many dryland environments, but then the plant towards the end is running out of fuel. And one week, the plants look excellent, the years are upright, and the next you start seeing that the plant is still completely green, but the ears are basically hanging. Then you know that those ears basically, they are finishing and the plant is rushing into maturity. And even if you open the ears and and remove the husk, and if you look at the ears and the kernels were not fully uh, complete on the milk line, you will know that those kernels basically, since the the ear is disconnected from the plant, those kernels basically, they will they will reach maturity very soon. So the plan basically stopped working at that moment. These are one of the fields that we need to start thinking, okay, in terms of priority for harvesting, 
take a very close look to those fields because the shanks are very susceptible. And if you have another freeze event, and if you have any other potential issues connected to insects or disease affecting that section of the plant, we will start seeing ears on the ground. Right. And there's your harvest and then issue. We don't, yeah. yeah. Then we'll, we'll start talking about a very different situation here because for picking up those ears, I mean, that would be a, another big problem. If you see a field that is, shows ears that are hanging like this, what we call the droopy ears, if you want to wait until moisture is around, um, maybe less than 18% and getting closer to 15 I would say those are the fields that uh, I mean, you need to put a priority and, and make sure that you harvest first because we might be losing that integrity of the ear shank. And if you lose that integrity of the ear shank, we will be talking about all the potential problems. Producers, have a close look at your fields. If you see this ear droop, you might earmark that field for early harvest. And just briefly here as well, Ignacio, in as far as crop dry down, which uh, has come into some question recently because of our quite cool evenings around Kansas. What is this telling producers as far as their harvest timing? We have a very good information on dry down. I mean, collecting the last couple of years, and then uh, that dry down in corn, when the corn reach black layer maturity, we usually say it's around 35%. So that's the moment that that kernel is in, independent from the plant. That kernel and the dry down until harvest moisture. It only depends on the environmental conditions. As temperature is a big factor, precipitation, humidity is another factor. So I will still see, I mean, based on our data, that we probably can attain this, um, I would say, optimal dry down rate that is usually around from 35% to 15%. On average, I would say that usually we lose around one point of water per day. So if you're looking about 20 units of water in the seat, uh, we are around 20 days average. And that average can be in some places, I mean, around 20 to 25 days. So, so far today, uh, we are still probably on the slow side on the temperature, but the good thing is, is that the corn that is, has been reached black layer at the right time with the right water content is the one that usually will dry out really fast. Mm-hmm. As we discussed a minute ago, the corn that is looking on, on these droopy ears, usually that corn, because it terminated earlier, it should be, it reached black layer with a high moisture content. So that is out of the fields that most likely they might need more time for desiccation. And then that's why I was trying to emphasize we really need to be on the look because those are the fields that if we leave it hanging there uh, and if we have another freeze or another specific events like an uh, insect or disease affecting the integrity of those ear shanks, I think that we are looking for the perfect storm in those, in those fields. Another reason why you producers who might see these ear drooping problems need to stay on top of that. You're walking that fine line between uh, higher moisture than you'd like to harvest and that crop dropping ears. Ignacio, thanks for joining us. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Eric. Ignacio Ciampitti is a crop production and cropping systems specialist with K-State Research and Extension. Agriculture Today is back after this break over the K-State Radio Network. With the shortage of primary care physicians, especially in rural areas, health education and disease prevention are vital. K-State Research and Extension programs address quality of life, personal development, and health behaviors across all life stages of all social economic groups. To learn more about health education, one of K-State Research and Extension's five grand challenges, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. You're tuned in to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Welcome back. 
Eric Atkinson with you. Over to today's agricultural news headlines for you now, courtesy in part of DTN. Starting with this week's Kansas Crop Progress and Condition Report out from the USDA. And for the week ending this past Sunday, our topsoil moisture around Kansas stood at 2% surplus, 61% adequate, and 37% short to very short, while subsoil moisture was at 2% surplus and 60% adequate, 38% short to very short. Short. Winter wheat planting in the state, 14% complete. That's very near the five-year average. Emergence was at 1%. The condition of the Kansas corn crop, 54% good to excellent, 30% fair, 16% poor to very poor. Corn now mature at 67%, and corn harvest in Kansas, 16% complete. Soybean crop condition then, 45% good to excellent, 37% fair, 18% poor to very poor. Soybeans dropping leaves in the state at 48%, and the soybean harvest is 2% in. Grain sorghum condition, 59% good to excellent, 32% fair, 9% poor to very poor. Sorghum now at mature is 32%, and the sorghum harvest is at 2% complete. Range and pasture conditions this week, 37% good to excellent, 38% fair, and 25% poor to very poor. Here's USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey now with a look at corn and soybean harvest progress nationally. Our look at corn harvesting for the week ending September 20th, we see 8% of the U.S. corn acreage harvested on that date. That's two points behind the five-year average of 10%, but ahead of last year's 6%. Looking at the Midwest specifically, Missouri leads that region with 13% of its corn harvested. Meanwhile, to the West, Nebraska getting off to a quick start. They're the only other Midwestern state to reach double digits at this point in the corn harvest, 10% on September 20th. That is ahead of the five-year average of 4%. Meanwhile, the soybean crop also maturing fairly rapidly, 59% of the soybeans dropping leaves by September 20th, well ahead of the five-year average of 50%, and even further ahead of last year's 29% on September 20th. 6% of the U.S. soybeans harvested by September 20th. That's equal to the five-year average, but well ahead of last year's pace of 2%. We see the harvest most advanced in the south, of course, in Louisiana, for example, 66% harvested. Five-year average is 59%. As you move up into the Midwest, for the most part, very little harvest progress at this early stage. The state's leading at this time, North Dakota and Minnesota, both at 7% harvested. Elsewhere in the Midwest, harvest progress is 5% of the soybeans or less. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey there. Short-term funding for the USDA's Commodity Credit Corporation has become a major political fight as House Democrat leaders put forward a short-term bill to fund the federal government that does not replenish that USDA fund. Language was released for a continuing resolution to fund the government through December the 11th. Republican senators immediately denounced the bill for not including $30 billion for the Commodity Credit Corporation. House Agriculture Committee Ranking Member Michael Connell has presented an amendment to replenish the CCC funds to continue funding programs that it finances. For you now on Agriculture Today, this week's edition of Milk Lines with K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook. Mike? Today I'd like to talk to the Kansas dairy farmers concerning the corn silage that we've been harvesting this fall. You know, across most of the state, the corn crop this year actually is really good. In fact, uh, many of the fields that have been chopped for silage, as we look at grain yields that would have come from those fields, it would probably be somewhere between the 150 and 210 bushels per acre, and that's on dry land. So as you think about that, that's going to have a huge impact on the corn silage that we have put into our bunker or into our silos. As you might notice, there's a lot of grain in it. It probably looks pretty yellow in most cases. So How's that going to affect the dairy cows? And I think it's an important thing for us to consider. First off, we really need to let that ferment for at least 21 days. If you're uh, going a little bit shorter or even if you've uh, opened that uh, silo a little bit early and started feeding out of it, you've probably noticed some increased heat 
in your bunk. In other words, there's some secondary fermentation going on. That's because the corn silage is not yet fully fermented and the effects of those acids that are formed haven't really taken total effect. One of the other issues that we're going to run into is starch contents. As we look at the starch content of the 2020 corn silage crop, it's going to be elevated greatly over what we normally expect. In many cases, our grain yields are probably twice what we would normally have on our corn silage fields. That's going to present some nutritional challenges, and you and your nutritionist need to be on top of that. I would strongly recommend that even before you start feeding the 2020 crop that you obtain a test of it so you can determine just how much starch is actually in there and then rations be reformulated accordingly. Another thing that you're going to have to keep an eye on is the fact that starch availability changes over time. You see, if you start feeding some of that 2020 corn silage, particularly only after about 21 to 28 days of fermentation, you're going to probably see an increased number of partial kernels in the manure. And if you kick the manure piles apart, you'll find that. Well, that's because our starch isn't being fully utilized. So as that corn silage continues to go through the process of total fermentation, the organic acids are breaking down the starch matrix in those kernels, making it more available. And that will continue for about 90 to um, 120 days after harvest. So starch becomes more available. We've got more starch in the corn silage this year than normal. And unless we make some serious adjustments to how we're feeding other sources of starch to our animals, we're likely going to run into some issues with subacute acidosis. You'll see it as a lower fat test. You may see it also as digestive upsets. So my counsel to you as a dairy farmer is make sure you stay on top of this. Make sure you get your nutritionist involved. Make sure that you do the appropriate testing on the corn silage, and I would even do that before I started feeding if possible. I think going into this crop and feeding it straight without adjustments to your ration probably will not put your cows in the best possible situation. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairymen to take a close look at the 2020 corn silage crop for nutrient content, especially starch. Thanks, Mike. And this is Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus. So if you have a fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going in. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Next up on Agriculture Today, our weekly conversation with Charlie Lee, wildlife specialist, K-State Research and Extension on another aspect of wildlife management. Well, Charlie, we're going to talk about camera traps today as a means of detecting animals in the wild and, and the possible use of lures in combination with this method. But explain the method itself, if you would. Well, motion-triggered camera traps have been used for many years. Uh, They're widely used for research. Hunters uh, use them for scouting and observing deer or other species that are nearby. And there's a lot of benefits when they're used for ecological research as opposed to live trapping. You eliminate the trap-associated mortality or injury events that might occur. They're fairly easy to deploy Uh, They're going down in cost, so they're cost-effective. And the question then becomes, do you actually get an image of all of the species that are present? So when we have those unknowns about what species are not being captured, there comes into question whether these camera traps are actually efficient at capturing the species uh, that you're trying to capture. Most of these trapping events are looking at ecological questions such as wildlife distribution or abundance or the other species associated with those targeted species. It's important to try to capture all species present. We know that people have been trapping for fur for years have always used lures, and those lures have been targeted for certain species. So 
there's been a lot of attempts at putting a lure nearby a camera trap so that it would increase the number of species that would come and investigate and then that you could tally as being associated with that wildlife community in that ecological area. And these lures would be food, would be some sort of other attractant, what? They can be food, they can be other attractants. Uh, This particular project, which was done by Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago, was using a fatty acid scent, which is commonly used to capture predators and has been used for tracking surveys for many years. The study was done in forest preserves uh, in downtown Chicago, and they utilized these camera traps for 28 consecutive days in August through September of 2018. The camera traps um, collected images, as you would expect. They collected over 11,000 images. Then those images were reviewed by a panel of observers to make sure that they could agree on what species uh, were involved and what species were depicted. They found that 12 species of mammals were identified through that trapping effort, and 55% of those images included mammals. There were eight mammals that had enough data collected to try to determine whether the lure increased the number of days in which a species was detected or decreased the amount of time to first detection or increased the number of photographs of a particular species. Those were the three sample questions that they tried to get answers for. And just briefly here, what were the prevalent mammals that they did capture? Well, coyotes had 123 photos. Chipmunks had almost 400 photos. Eastern cottontail rabbits, uh, 70 images. Uh, Gray squirrels, uh, 1,900 images. Fox squirrels, 450 images. Uh, raccoons, 1,500 images, opossums, almost 400 images, deer, uh, over 1,000 images. Those were the primary species that were identified. There were some rarer species identified, such as mink and long-tailed weasels and southern flying squirrels and striped skunks. But the most common species are those that you would expect to be in a suburban urban park. So what did this study conclude about how well lures work in tandem with camera traps in identifying and recording wildlife activity? Well, they found that coyotes' probability of being detected did not increase when lure was present. That is not what I would have expected since I've trapped coyotes for a long period of time and lures seem to be very effective at getting a coyote to come over to the trap site. But in this case, those fatty acid scents did not increase the probability of being detected. Without lure, the number of days to first detection varied, again, by species. The Virginia possum responded most to the presence of lure. Their daily detection probability rose by roughly 5%, and the number of opossum images nearly doubled when the lure was present. However, the lure was a negative for most of the prey species. When the lure was present, cottontail rabbit detection probability decreased by 5%, and they were photographed 63% less often. The eastern gray squirrel arrived 70% later to a camera trap if the lure was present, and they were photographed 14% less often. So it really depends upon what species. It appears that the top carnivore, which would have been coyote, didn't really care about fatty acid scent. Other species like raccoon and opossum that could be uh, carnivores or generalists slightly increased, but prey species definitely decreased with the use of lure. So what does this say overall about the use of lures in this manner? Because there's so much of a difference between species, is it a technique that really needs to be looked at more what? I think you have to consider which species are being targeted. If you're looking at a general ecological community, then probably lures are not important. 
If you're trying to target a particular species, then select a lure or bait that is more likely to attract that species. So what it tells me is that there's no one particular lure or bait that's suitable for all species. There's another part to this, of course, and that is actually deploying the camera traps, doing that appropriately to achieve the objectives of this project. And, Charlie, that's what we'll take up when you return right here next week. Until then, many thanks. That's from Wildlife Specialist Charlie Lee of K-State Research and Extension. And that caps off our Tuesday edition. Thanks for being along with us. Eric Atkinson bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. Over this, the K-State Radio Network.